If you turn in your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. When you find that, if you'd stand with me, please. We're going to read the first 12 verses responsively. I'll read the first verse. You read the second verse, and we'll alternate accordingly. And together on verse number 12, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you for giving us a a written word that we can hear from you. God, I pray that as we uh, come upon the time in the service that uh, we hear from you through your word, that we would just be able to uh, open our hearts to hear exactly what you have for us. I pray that you would prepare us now for the message uh, through the special, and I pray that uh, you would just be honored and glorified. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When our Lord was speaking to the crowd, a bigger king who fell down before Christ and called out his name. The disciples quickly came, and they turned the men away, till they saw the Lord's compassion, and they heard the Savior say, Lady 
Matthew chapter 5. Well, if this uh, message has a title, I guess the title would be, Have You Been Blessed? Have You Been Blessed? Fifth chapter of uh, Matthew, verse 1, says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Them would be his disciples, right? He taught them, saying. So, who we're talking about in, these, in this uh, Sermon on the Mount, as it's been uh, coined, who we're talking to are the disciples. These are followers of Christ. These are those who, who uh, he walked, they walked with Him, they talked with Him, they, they were able to just um, be with Him an awful lot. These are disciples of Christ. These are the, these are the Christians of the day. All right? These are those who are uh, telling about Christ, who, who uh, exclaiming the good news. And after uh, being with the multitudes, they, they went to a mountain and he said, okay guys, this is what it takes to be blessed. This is, this is, this is what, what we're going to start with here. This is what we're going to be, how, how we're going to be blessed. And uh, this isn't a, a, uh, a sermon for the multitudes, it's not a sermon for the, the great masses. This is, this is very specific to uh, his disciples. They're very specific to the Christians today. What's that word blessed mean first? Happy. All right. I, uh, I remember I, I went to Christian school, oh, first through third grade, I guess, uh, out there at Maranatha. And um, I remember somebody, uh, they chose one of the uh, children to... Uh, pray for the food uh, at lunchtime. And we had just gone through the uh, Beatitudes there. We'd just gone through the Sermon on the Mount. And this, uh, this little boy, he was my classmate. Uh, I was little too. Uh, but this little boy, he says, Lord, I pray that you would happy this food to my body. <laughs> and because he, he took the, the literal interpretation there that uh, blessed means happy. So and we know that uh, you know, the adults always say, bless this food. Uh, to our bodies, which um, it, it, I, I think that's more uh, make our bodies happy about this food uh, is uh, really what that comes comes down to. But it is in, in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, uh, that word is to uh, be made happy or prosperous, um, extolled, um, to be happy. These, uh, and, and really when it comes down to it, these uh, nine Beatitudes that uh, we're going to look at uh, this evening, they constitute the believer's guidelines, as it were, and the, um, uh, really the pursuit of true happiness. If you're going to be happy, then this is uh, what your life is going to look like. This is uh, kind of like the, the uh, Christian Declaration of Independence, right? Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. If you're going to pursue happiness then these are going to be the things that are going to be in your life, all right? And uh, the world obviously has a different uh, view of happiness, a different uh, perspective than we do. But uh, we, we, we're going to look at this. Now, when, when the Bible talks about um, God uh, and blessing God, it's, it's more of an issue of... Um, Bring happiness to God, not say, you know, making God happy and getting giving God that happiness. You know, it, it is uh, to uh, bring happiness to God. Like in First Samuel, it says, "Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Make make him happy. Make him make him look good." All right. Um, so we're going to look at these, and uh, we're first going to look at whether we have a blessed attitude. A blessed attitude. All right, we're going to look at that in uh, chapter 5, verse, starting in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you have a blessed attitude tonight? Do you have a blessed attitude towards self, first of all? 
Um, blessed are the poor in spirit. What is that? That's, that's a humility. Uh, in other words, when we come to God and we, uh, we are with others, do we recognize that, you know what, I, I've, I'm not all that, right? I'm, uh, I know that I, I'm not going to live a victorious life without Jesus Christ. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on, on Wednesday, I believe, but we, we, we know that as uh, Romans 7.24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We realize that our, our victories only come from Christ. Uh, we also recognize that we're, we're helpless, um, but Christ is limitless. In Philippians chapter 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Do we recognize, do we realize that uh, this life isn't all about us? Or do we, we're trying, do we try to uh, make all of my plans and my, my ambitions and everything that I do uh, all about what I have and what I, what I do? Philippians uh, 2, uh, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. That's what this poor in spirit is. In, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Is that how we operate in our day-to-day life? Do we have a blessed attitude uh, towards self? And then, do we have a blessed attitude in the next verse towards sin? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do we have a blessed attitude towards sin like David did when he was found out to have sinned and he went to God in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10 he says um, create in me a clean heart O God and restore the right spirit within me he recognized you know what I've messed up I'm really Really sorry, I've messed up. Blessed are those that mourn. I, I think that's blessing, blessing those who mourn over their own sin. How often is it that we uh, go days, weeks, months without recognizing our failures and recognizing our faults and keeping that clean slate before God? So I believe we have that mourning for our sin and then also mourning over other sin. What's uh, Psalm one twenty six six? is uh, the um, he that goeth forth and weepeth, right? Is that mourning? He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bring his sheaves with him. Am I not only mourning my sins, but am I mourning other sins? Um, I think of the song that says, Let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. A world of men who don't understand. These are, these are folks that all around the world that don't understand. You, you, we had uh, pastors in the Philippines right now, and um, they are, they're, they're just, there's lots and lots and lots of there's souls that have never heard. And uh, it's exciting to see what churches they're in and what they've been able to do. And the uh, service that they had Sunday morning uh, was, it was a, a packed house and had uh, uh, baptisms. They had their baptism before the service. It was uh, really uh, interesting to me. But they, they, had, uh, they had scores of people baptized. And it was just very... Uh, it's, do we look at this world... Through the eyes of mourning. I, I have a hunch that if we would mourn for sinners and mourn for souls, we'd be a lot more um, active in our own uh, witnessing. We'd be a lot more uh, participating in uh, faith promise missions. We'd, we would uh, be a lot more active e- even here at the church. Um, are we mourning for the souls of others? So we have a blessed attitude towards sin. And then do we have a blessed attitude in verse 5? 
towards submission. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, meekness, we, uh, we learn in our you that meekness is that ability for God's people to negotiate among others without causing friction. That, that ability to be that uh, lubricant, if you would, in uh, certain circumstances and be able to be the one who uh, reduces the friction in those uh, relationships. And uh, Jesus, He was that, uh, that perfect meek one. He, he was able to uh, uh, be meek. He says, I am meek and lowly in heart in Matthew. But the reason it's, it's difficult, and this is a, it's a tough thing to do to be meek, is because we have a few things against us. A few things that this world has that uh, really we, uh, we have uh, combating us. One is the fact that uh, we have a lot of weaknesses ourselves, right? We have, we have a lot of things that we do that, um, and, and bents and normal uh, human things, because we're human, that we do that really cause us to uh, have friction among others. Uh, the, th- the second thing we have is we have uh, live in a world with a bunch of other humans, and they're all imperfect as well, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about our uh, spouse or our boss or our neighbor or uh, whoever it is. We have us who, who's uh, human and imperfect. We have others uh, that are around us that are, in, in, uh, that are human and imperfect, and then we have uh, uh, Satan who is continually working on uh, getting us to react uh, to one another imperfectly and uh, in a, a human manner. So those three things are what really uh, takes us to say, um, my meek. Do I always cause friction, or 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 am I meek? Do we need to be? Uh, do we need to always be the boss? Always be the one in charge? Always be the one that uh, is is over everything? You always have to, have to always have to get your two cents worth in. You know, you're one that no matter what the conversation is, you have to you have to have that last word. That's not the meek, all right. That's not that meek and lowly in heart. Meekness is one of the fruit of the spirit, right? That's not what I want to do, but that's what God wants us to do. We're still looking at our blessed attitude. Let's look at the fourth one. This is in verse number 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And keeping with the S's, we have a blessed attitude towards spiritual sterilization. Spiritual sterilization. Sterilization. This is that create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me that David's talking about. This is that I know I need uh, a, a cleansing. I know that uh, you know. I know. I know I'm forgiven. Whether I uh, I sin or not, I'm forgiven. You know that because when we when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, He He forgave all of our sins that we did in the past. He forgave every sin that you're uh, committing now. And He forgave every sin that you'll ever commit in the future. You know that? It was one and done. He he has forgiven every sin. It doesn't mean we always have a clean heart. What we need to do to to, uh, fix that relationship that we have with God is to ask God to create in us a clean heart and renew that right spirit within me. We don't really need to ask uh, for him to uh, forgive us because uh, in, the, in the literal sense, those sins are already forgiven. Those sins are definitely forgiven. But we do need to ask God to cleanse us, to renew that right spirit within us. Psalm chapter 37, we're learning about this in our you a little bit too. The steps of a good man, verse 23, are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hands. The, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And then he says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. What's that mean? Not going not to stay down. It's not going to be 
you know, staying in the mud. He's not going to kick them while they're down. He, he's, the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The Lord wants to pull you out of that miry clay, right? And the cool thing about that verse to me is it says steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And if the good, that good man will fall, I know that I'm not a good man. And so I'm, I'm pretty grateful that even if he, he will bring that good man uh, back up and upholdeth him with his hands, then uh, I have hope too, right? Because if the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Uh, if, we have a, if we're going to have a blessed attitude, and we're going to be happy, our desire is to have a, a clean heart. Our desire is going to be kind of like uh, David said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. If my sin is ever before me, but I know that you can create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew that right spirit within me. So, first, do you have a blessed attitude? Okay. Second, we're going to uh, ask, are we having, uh, do we have... Do we perform blessed actions? Do we perform blessed actions? Number one, uh, verse six, we'll go back up to verse six. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Is it our nature to want to do what's right? Is it our nature to do, uh, want to do uh, righteousness? Um, has God changed our thought process enough? to make us want to do what God wants us to do more than what we want us to do. Blessed, is, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. What is it that you desire more than anything? What is it that you, you, you want? Is it that, that righteousness? Do you hunger and thirst after that righteousness? If so, they shall be filled. So do we pursue righteousness in verse 6? And then let's look at verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Do we pursue mercy? Do we say we are that, uh, are they, we that compassionate, that tender, that uh, unwilling to punish for injuries, as the dictionary says? Are we willing to, in that mercy, are we willing to say, you know what, I'm going to allow someone to wrong me today? Because I'm going to be forgiving. I'm going to allow somebody just to, to do me wrong. And it's going to be okay because I'm willing to forgive. That's mercy. When you forgive, even when they don't ask you to forgive, that's mercy. Right? That's what God wants from us. He wants us to forgive even if we don't, if they don't ask us to forgive. When he, he talks about the 70, forgiving 70 times 7, that's, that's not a, a, numbers, a numbers thing. He's not saying, you know, after 490 times, you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to forgive them anymore. That's that magic number there. No, it's forgive and forgive and forgive. Even if they don't ask you for forgiveness, you know that? I challenge you to find a place in the Bible that tells you that you only forgive once they ask you to forgive. We're commanded to forgive, not to forgive with conditions. That's what meekness is. Or, yeah, that's what mercy is, I'm sorry. Is that, that forgiving, even when we don't for, feel like forgiving. Okay? We're going to pursue righteousness, pursue mercy, and then verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This is... Uh, a lot of this uh, would go very uh, close and hand to hand uh, with the meekness, but uh, we realize that uh, in, in reality, Jesus is the only real peacemaker, don't we? We know that Jesus is the one that can really uh, give us peace. That that peace, we uh, would go again back to the RU definition: is safe from harm and spirit, mind, and body. Recognizing that, you know what? It doesn't matter what comes my way. God can take care of it. He has that peace. He, he's, he can, he's given me that peace. 
And um, Romans 5, 1, before there can be any peace between God and man, there must be peace between man and God, right? Be- between we have, before we have peace among one another, we really need to have peace, our, our peace with God, which uh, in Romans 5, 1, it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? His blood had, has reconciled God to man. <clears throat> His disciples, we can then be uh, peacemakers by urging men to be reconciled to God. As we are uh, going about our everyday life and, and we are uh, in our jobs or in our uh, uh, day of, uh, way of life here and we are accept, uh, uh, giving uh, giving the gospel, and we are uh, living uh, a, a Christ-like life so others can see uh, Christ in us, then uh, those folks that we bring to Christ, they having peace with God, that, that in turn um, gives us that uh, title of peacemaker. All right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So we have a blessed attitude. Blessed action. And then the question is, have we experienced any blessed attacks? Had to do another A in there, okay? Blessed attacks. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are we willing to suffer for Christ and for his righteousness? Now, we're not talking about... Um, the we might mention that later on the martyr mentality, the 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 thought of I'm going to just suffer for Jesus so people can see how miserable I am and see that I am I am just suffering for Jesus so I'm all all that that's that's not what we're talking about here all right um, but it is blessed it is a blessing to suffer for righteousness for His. <clears throat> namesake, 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given on, in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. In 2 Timothy 2, he's talking to, talking to uh, uh, Paul's talking to Timothy there, and uh, he, he says, uh, the beginning, he, he says, the things which I have said of you, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And he, he's saying, you're, you're, a, you're, you're supposed to teach teachers here. And um, he, in verse 12, he says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we are, if we're doing this thing called life correctly as a Christian, it's not going to blend with the world. It's not going to be in sync with what the world is doing on a day-to-day basis, right? Therefore, we're going to come, come up on some things that um, rub folks the wrong way. And uh, we'll, we'll be persecuted of sorts. Um, we don't have in this country, gratefully, the um, stoning for coming to church or uh, having, a, having the, uh, the persecution in that light. But I, I do believe that there are uh, times in which if we're, if we're following hard after Christ, then uh, it, it's going to be uncomfortable. And it's, it's going to be not, um, not a wonderful uh, human experience uh, if we are doing what Christ would have us to do. Second uh, Timothy three twelve says, "Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer for pers- suffer persecution." So there is that uh, cause for persecution that is for righteousness' sake, and then there is a um, cross. Verse eleven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and shall persecute you and shall 
say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Whose sake should we suffer for? Not for mine. Let's go back to the, the martyr, martyr mentality. It says for my sake. If you're just if you're just wanting to suffer for Jesus just so you can get attention, uh, it doesn't apply here. It's not what we're talking about at all. For my sake, for His name's sake, that that means He's got to look good. All right, he, He's got to be put in that good light. All right. There's a cause for persecution. There's a cross, and then. Lastly there, verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. There's a crown. Cause, cross, crown. Okay? Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they the prophets which were before you. So, if we have this blessed attitude... Towards self, sin, submission, and uh, sterilization, right? We have blessed actions, blessed attacks. And then all those things come together and we should be a, uh, happy Christians, right? All right. And so what, what is that that we become? I think we can see that in verse 13. These people, after, after you do all these things, disciples... You take care of these things in your life. You get this uh, taken care of in your life. And then ye are the salt of the earth. Yeah? But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You disciples, I'm telling you, this is how to live your life. This is what I want from you. It be attitudes. This is... This is what my expectations are. And now, we've got that. Now, you're the salt of the earth. Get out there and do your job. Right? Uh, what is the salt of the earth? Salt has a lot of uh, amazing properties. And I think we could take a look at that salt and say, uh, the, the Christian as the salt of the earth has a lot of properties here in this world. And the one property is... Uh, salt is a cleansing agent, isn't it? If, uh, if you're in a uh, uh, remote place, Brother Moreland can probably attest to this better than uh, some, but if uh, you're in a, uh, a remote place and you don't have the capacity to uh, clean uh, wounds like you, you might uh, want to, you can use salt as that cleansing agent. It's painful, but you can use that salt as a cleansing agent. All right? Uh, the other thing that uh, salt does, it stimulates the appetite. What's our job as Christians? Stimulate the appetite of God's Word, of what, what uh, other people see for Christ, uh, uh, Christ in us, right? And then the other thing it does is it prevents decay. You know, what would this world be like if it wasn't for Christians? What, what would this world be like? And when, when all the Christians leave the world... It's going to be a depressing, wretched place. It, it, it's the Christians and the Holy Spirit that is keeping this place together as it is, right? So, so the salt of the earth is preventing decay. The salt of the earth um, prevents peace. In days of old, they used uh, um, salt is actually as a, as a treaty, if you will. They would uh, take and if uh, they uh, were at a meal and... They were having a treaty. If they used salt in that meal, that was just as good as a, a uh, uh, you know, better than a handshake, better than, you know, sealing with blood. It was, it, that salt was that covenant, if you would, all right? And then, um, I think another reason that Jesus said you're the salt of the earth is because salt is a precious commodity. Salt is, it's priceless, really. In uh, days of old, again, they would use salt in, in trading, in, in purchasing. It had a, a really high, high purchasing value. It's kind of where, the, where that phrase, uh, worth your weight in salt, uh, comes from. 
and um, but you're the soul of the earth. We become that blessed person. He says, you're the soul of the earth. And then, verse 14, he takes it a little further. He says, and you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men hide a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it give a light unto all that is in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And here we go again. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. whole Christian life is about glorifying God, isn't it? That, that's all we're here for, is to glorify God. You know, the, the Bible says, you know, he could have the rocks cry out and, uh, you know, say wonderful things about me. That's the Bob Reed paraphrase. But instead, he lets us be here. And for us to uh, praise him. The light of the world is meant to be seen by men. You know, the interesting, another interesting thing I think of as of a light, if, if I were to take a flashlight in here and I'd turn it on, it might not make a whole lot of difference because we've got a pretty bright place in here, right? So you may not see my flashlight. But if we turn all those lights off and then I turn my flashlight on, man, now it starts making a serious difference. Your light shines brightest in the darkest places, in the darkest of nights, in darkness, darkest of times. That's when the light needs to shine the brightest. And if we're, we're going to be able to be that light of the world and that soul of the earth, the way we're going to be able to do that is if we take these beatitudes, blessed are poor in spirit, they that mourn, meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? Merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and willing to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Those things make us blessed Christians, happy Christians. Alright? That's, uh, that's what God wants for us tonight. Because he's saying this to his disciples. Saying this to, to those closest to him. Those Christians, alright? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that we would have that desire tonight to be blessed. And I pray that you would help us to have a blessed attitude and these blessed actions. God, we should want more than anything to make you look good. So as people look at us, that they would see the light of Jesus Christ shining right through us. God, I pray that as we conclude the service tonight, that we would take an inward look, see what you would have for us, and what changes you would have for us tonight. I wonder tonight, as we're coming into the invitation time, if maybe you might say, you know, I don't see the these beatitudes, these all these blesseds as something that's in my life and I need to allow God to change those things. Maybe you'd say I don't see myself as the salt of the earth or the light of the world. More than anything, I'd like to see God use me in that way. Or maybe, just maybe, there might be somebody here tonight that has never accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They're taking the assumption that 
everything's all right, and I don't need to make that change in my life either. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that God says, today is the day of salvation. And if that's you, I uh, pray that you would come and let somebody take the, a Bible and show you how you can have eternal life as well. Lord God, as we move into the invitation time, I pray that you would work in every heart, move up and down each aisle, and show us all what you would have for us tonight. We thank you and we praise you for what you're doing here.